and feedback and talking is always welcomed and encouraged. Um, Brandon's mentioned a couple times Antiochus Epiphanes and asked possibly doing a study on that. Um, so I got to looking at it and thinking about it, and uh, I guess it was three or four years ago, me and him were talking, and I realized, that, hey, wait a minute, this prophecy in Daniel has already been fulfilled. And I got the, in some of my reading and stuff like that, and he's like, yeah, you, you know, you're right. So we both got to studying on it and found stuff on Antiochus Epiphanes and that kind of stuff. Antiochus Epiphanes, I'm going to explain it here in just a little bit, but um, it, it, it's, it's basically a ruler of part of the Greek Empire at one point in time. And he is a, a shadow, basically, of the Antichrist that is to come. Um, and it, it's a very, very good shadow and rep very good representation. You know, the book, the Bible is full of types and shadows, you know, people that preview, people that are to follow, um, think like um, Abraham and Isaac, you know, picture of the sacrifice of Christ, or Joshua coming in, and Jesus, you know, the Redeemer for the people. Actually, Joshua and Jesus are actually the same name in Hebrew. A lot of people don't realize that, but Yeshua and, or Jesus and Joshua are actually the same name. Uh, God redeems it, basically, is what the meaning of that name is. Um, but, so, got to thinking about it, and I'm studying it, looking at it, and I'm trying to figure out, okay, how do I do this without just straight up doing a history lesson? Because that, it's, it's all, a lot of Greek history. Now, Antiochus Epiphanes is not directly mentioned within the Bible, um, by name. Um, he is, however, mentioned in the Archippa, which was actually part of the King James Bible up until the mid to late 1800s. There's a section of, they call them deuterocanical books, that are not scripture per se, but they're good for um, studying and enlightenment in history books. And there's a couple books in here called the Maccabees, uh, first and second Maccabees that um, they're not actually continuations they're retellings by probably different authors um, th of the story of um, the Maccabees a small Jewish war that they had um, around 168 uh, BC so and Antiochus Epiphanes is a key character in that war in within that book um, no they were not Muslims they were Greeks um, actually I'm gonna read a couple pieces of scripture real quick um, and straighten up a couple misconceptions with some of it um, real quick in Daniel 7 um, 3 through 8 and four great beasts come up from the sea diverse from one another the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings, and I beheld the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted from the earth and made it stand upon his feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, it raised itself up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth in between its teeth. And they said thus to it, it arise and devour much flesh. After this, I beheld and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong, exceeding, and it had a great iron teeth, and it devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with its feet, with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and had ten horns. I considered the horns, and there came among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and, ma and a mouth speaking great things. Okay, now, within prophecy and reading biblical scripture, that little horn that pops up, that is what people consider the Antichrist. Okay, within the prophecies of Daniel. Now, if you read on forward a little bit, it actually explains 
this in um, verse 16 explains this vision a little bit. One of the angels explains it to Daniel. Now, I came near to one of them and stood and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known the interpretation of these things. So he's interpreting it for him. And these great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Now, that's basically these kings or these kingdoms are four kingdoms that come up out of the earth, out of the people, out of the Gentile people. These four kings come up out of the sea. Anytime you see a sea represented, it is people of the earth that are not Israelites or not Jewish. Okay? And these beasts rise up out of the sea. Okay? The sea of all the rest of us. Okay? So these beasts rise up in this section of prophecy. And you have the kings, the ten kings on the one beast, and then another little one comes out and is another ruler that's at a later time. Okay? On that fourth beast. They had the seven heads and the ten horns, etc. Okay? So that is a picture and depiction of the Antichrist. Now in chapter 8, the next chapter in Daniel, um, he has another vision about two years later. He's in the third year of Darius the Mede. Okay? Now these, these four kingdoms that were listed in the first are the Babylonians, the Mede-Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, and the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire to come at the end. Um, an extension of that part of that Roman Empire. Now, in chapter 8, we read, And I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before me the river, a ram which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, and so that, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could de deliver out of his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, behold, and he, a he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram which had two horns, which had which I had seen standing before the river, and ran into him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close to the ram, and he was moved with choler, or anger, against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast him down to the ground, and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hands. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken." For it, and for it came up four notable ones towards the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and towards the east and towards the pleasant land. Okay, so you've got that little horn that pops up in this verse as well. Now that is not... The Antichrist. It is a type and shadow of the Antichrist. It's depicted within the same way, but where does this little horn come from? Okay, the first ram with the two horns, one growing up later and larger, is the Medo Persian Empire. Okay, the Medes, the Persians took over, the horn grew larger, the Persians were. Um, a larger, more rich empire under Xerxes. Um, it hit its peak. Then the he-goat comes in, comes across with a single large horn. That he-goat is the Grecian empire. Alexander the Great is that large horn. And at the height of his power, after he had basically conquered the known world at that time, he died. Um, he actually crossed the sea and started his campaigns um, and started conquering at about the age 20. Um, and by the time he was 32 or so, he was dead. Um, 
which is around 323 AD, I mean BC, excuse me. So you've got Alexander the Great. So he dies. Now, when he dies, he actually split the kingdom up. Basically three part, or basically four parts. It's actually six, but two of those got swallowed up by the other two. By two of the others. Um, so you got four horns. A northern kingdom, an eastern kingdom, a southern kingdom, and a western kingdom. Now, so basically you've got Assyria, Egypt, Turkey, and Greece. Okay? So, with those kingdoms, out of one of those kingdoms comes this little horn. Okay? If you back up to verse 9 real quick. And out of one of them came forth a little horn. That's the key verse right there. That tells you that this is not the Antichrist little horn from the previous chapter. Okay? Because the previous chapter, it came from the massive beast with the ten horns. Okay? So, it's not the same Antichrist type person. But it's depicted within the same way. Because horns mean power, rulers, that kind of stuff when you're interpreting prophecy. prophecy. So, um, I'll go ahead and finish reading that real quick. Um, and it waxed great even to the host of heaven, cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground, and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host... And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And an host was given to him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Okay? Now, that sounds like this little horn here is doing some pretty great things, right? You know, he's accomplishing a lot of stuff. And this is one of the visions that made Daniel sick for weeks and fasted for weeks to where he, he's like, you know, I can't, I can't take this. You know, he starts praying to God for forgiveness for the Is, Israelite people um, because of this vision or because of one of these visions like this. Okay. So with this vision... This section of scripture, this prophecy, has actually already happened. And it is fulfilled through Antiochus Epiphanes. He's the only one, or he's one in Greek history who fulfills all the points of this prophecy. Um, even down to the way that he... Um, there's another section in um, Daniel 11. I probably won't go there. But uh, Daniel 11, 21 through 40, that also speaks of this same person, Antiochus Epiphanes, um, taking the crown by treachery. He actually stole the um, kingdom from his brother's son. His brother was actually the rightful king. And his son was a captive in Rome at the time. And through bribery and treachery with Rome, he stole the kingdom. Okay. Um, actually, pull up 1121 real quick. I think it has it in. And this is a state shall stand a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Okay. And this is... A lot of this information comes from outside sources, Greek and Roman historians. Um, a lot of this stuff I get from this big thick book of the histories of Josephus. Um, he brings in some pretty interesting, fills in some gaps for a lot of stuff with um, Jewish history. Now, a lot, a lot of people are like, okay, when well, you know, you're writing the history, you can make it as colorful as you want kind of thing. Um, but he does a pretty good job of citing the works and the pieces of ancient literature that he uses to write his history. 
Um, he had access to several libraries. Um, I believe, actually, what was left of one of the uh, libraries that uh, people call the Great Library in Alexandria that was set up by Ptolemy. Um, I think he had access to parts of the books from it. And actually tells about Jewish scholars going to that library and transcribing the Jewish scriptures into Greek and placing them into that library. Um, I think it was 71 uh, Jewish people went to Egypt to transcribe the scriptures. And he gives an account of that as well. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that caught my eye on this is the ram crosses swiftly without touching the ground. Okay, which kind of, you know, always sounded strange to me. But one of the things Josephus points out is that Alexander the Great took a boat. Part of his army marched around, you know, the, around through Turkey. But he also took boats and landed right around Judea or Jerusalem, right in that area, the area of Israel. Okay, and Josephus relates a story of Alexander the Great coming ashore and the Jews uh, basically forming a treaty with Alexander the Great okay, at this time. And they actually pull out the scriptures and show him in the scriptures and say, hey, we think this is you. They used the scriptures of Daniel. They showed him the book of Daniel and said that they think this is you. And that you're going to conquer the Medes and the Persians. And that for that, he actually glorified God and paid for a massive amount of sacrifices in the Jewish temple. When he came through. And then he made a deal with them. Basically, he honored their Smita year, their seven-year celebration. The seventh year, they take off. They do no work. So if they're doing no work, they're not creating income. So every seventh year, he agreed not to take taxes from the Jewish people. Um, so it ties in several of these little stories and you know, fills in some gaps where, where, where some things are missing. Um, but back to Antiochus Epiphanes. So most of what we know comes from either Josephus, some other historians, and then we have another story that, how many of you have heard of Hanukkah? Pretty much everybody knows Hanukkah. It's one of the Jewish holidays that most everybody knows, because it Kind of coincides with Christmas, right? Okay, it's nothing like Christmas. <laughs> okay? First mistake. All right? Nothing like Christmas. How many of you know um, where Hanukkah would be in the Bible? Well, it's not in the Old Testament. Hanukkah, the events that Hanukkah commemorate actually happen in between the Old and the New Testament. The events that we get Hanukkah, they get Hanukkah from are recorded in the Maccabees, the first and second Maccabees. Um, along with Josephus also records those events as well. But in the Bible, Hanukkah doesn't show up until Jesus And if you'll pull up John 10, 22, Jesus celebrated Hanukkah. Okay? Hanukkah is the Hebrew word for dedication. Okay? And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Okay? Jesus is at, at the temple... In Jerusalem for the celebration of Hanukkah, okay, which is um, on Kislev, uh, 20, the 25th day of Kislev um, on the Jewish calendar, okay. So Hanukkah is to commemorate what God did for 
um, the Jewish people throughout the book of Maccabees. Okay? Now, there, there's some, some stories. It's also known as the Feast of Lights. Okay? You know, they light the menorah. And there's actually a legend about the menorah and the, only having enough uh, oil for the menorah for like a day or so. The best I can tell, that is not recorded in the book of Maccabees. It's slightly mentioned in Josephus, but it is evidently a uh, rabbinical or a rabbi's tradition that is not in any of the script or any of the books that I have that they pull that out of. Okay, so that that's it's possible with God. You know, all things are possible. He can make oil last for years if he wants to. But it was basically that they had enough oil to light the lamp for one day during the dedication ceremony, which the dedication ceremony lasts for eight days. Hanukkah lasts for eight days. When Solomon dedicated the temple, the first temple, the dedication celebration lasted eight days. And they just mirrored that with a rededication of the temple. This is what Hanukkah celebrates. So... Why did they have to rededicate the temple? Basically, it was because of Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, he didn't necessarily start all of it. A lot of it started with Alexander the Great. Basically, with a Hellenization or introducing Greek culture into the Jewish culture. They start sliding away. Sliding away from the Jewish culture and more and more people, okay, this is popular now, and they start easing towards that. You might think that mirrors today in any way whatsoever. Okay. The story of Hanukkah, in my mind, is an excellent representation of the sum total of end time prophecy. Okay. So, roughly... Um, 150 years between Alexander and Antiochus Epiphanes. Okay, during that time, they went through several Greek leaders in the Sucleidian Empire, which is the empire he rules. Okay, he fought the Ptolemy in Egypt. Um, those are the two that are really given and talked about within Daniel. Daniel 11 talks about the king of the south, the king of the north, them fighting trading daughters and this and that and the other. Um, one of those daughters is actually Cleopatra, would reflect Cleopatra within the biblical text. But you've got all this constant slide. A couple people took over Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is right in the middle of Ptolemy's empire and the empire that Antiochus ruled. Okay? So it's right in the middle, so it flops back and forth between the two empires a couple times during this 150 years. And then a uh, particular priest or a particular person um, makes a deal with Antiochus, basically. And in order to have himself made the high priest, he makes a deal with Antiochus. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing about four or five hours worth of reading right here. He basically makes a deal with Antiochus Epiphanes to make him the high priest by letting Antiochus Epiphanes into the city of Jerusalem, into the temple. Okay? So now Antiochus Epiphanes and his generals appoint this guy the high priest. He's a sympathizer. Okay? So they start putting in place people who sympathize with their way of life. And then a little bit later point, you know, there are people that believe the Greek Hellenistic way that everybody is equal. Everybody, you know, should share in the wealth. Those are concepts of this Hellenistic culture. Everybody should participate in the games, that kind of stuff. So, later on, Antiochus Epiphanes issues a decree 
making it illegal to practice any other religion. So he takes them to a one-world religion across his entire empire, to a single religion. And basically that is uh, the worship of Zeus or Jupiter. Jupiter is the Greek, Zeus is technically the Roman. But um, and those typically are interchangeable. Um, some people refer to it as Zeus, but Josephus calls it um, Jupiter throughout, throughout Josephus. But so he says, okay, you're only going to worship Jupiter. Everybody's going to have the same religion. Everybody has to start speaking Greek and writing Greek. He outlaws reading the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures. He outlaws prayer to the Hebrew God. He takes away the daily sacrifice from the temple. Makes it illegal for them to sacrifice to the God Yahweh. Okay? So he, he brings all this stuff around and makes it illegal. Not, not only does he make it illegal, if you are caught with a Jewish scripture or a sympathizing scripture, that's grounds for death. He makes them stop circumcising their children. So that, and actually it, in the Maccabean account, it actually says so that... Um, Any of the books of the law, they tore them up and burned them. And if anyone was found to possess a book of agreement or respect the law, the king's decree condemned them to death. And then um, refused to let them circumcise their children. If a mother was found with her child circumcised, they would kill the baby and hang the baby around the mother's neck. And this is some of the reasons why I think some of this was you know, kind of laid by the wayside. Because it's a history book, but it is a very graphic history book. Um, and then on the 25th fifth day of the month, this is actually the month of Kislev, the uh, 25th of Kislev, which um, Josephus says is supposedly, according to Greek tradition, the birthday of Jupiter as well. Um, they set up an altar, or they set up a, um, on the 25th month, they offered sacrifice upon the altar, which was set up for the burnt altar of burnt offering, and they sacrificed a pig on the Jewish altar, okay, and set up a um, statue of Jupiter uh, on top of, the Jewish altar in the Jewish temple, which this is, um, as Daniel calls it um, in um, chapter 11, the abomination of desolation. Okay? That is what is considered the abomination of desolation. If you're like, well, okay, well, if that already happened. Why is everybody looking for that in the future? Because we know it's going to happen again. Um, Matthew 24, when ye therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, so, Jesus celebrated Hanukkah. Okay? They called the sacrificing of the pigs and the statue of Zeus or Jupiter in the holy temple, the abomination that causes desolation. Okay? Jesus knew this. He was celebrating the feast to rededicate the temple after they've cleaned all this out and kicked, every, kicked the Greek people out. Okay? He's celebrating Hanukkah, the temple rededication. So he knows that this has already happened once. Okay, so that tells me that he also knows that it's going to happen again in the future at some point. Okay, because of this little verse right here. He says, when you see that again, you know that that time is near. Okay.
Does that make sense? Okay, so a couple little things um, about this, you know, that, that mirror kind of today, okay? You know, think about the times that we're living in today. Think about the, the gradual slide. You know, sometimes we jump plumb off a cliff when they, you know, the Supreme Court gets involved. But you've got the gradual slide. They, at first they start making things like the law or the Bible either illegal or um, offensive. That's a very good word for it. They turn the good things to bad things and the bad things to good things. You know, they also set up a um, gymnasium in Jerusalem um, around this time. That's one of the things that the, um, the fake high priest agreed to. They set up a gymnasium. Well, the Greek games in the gymnasium, all of those games were done by men, and those men were naked. Okay, so you could see who was a Jew and who was not a Jew. Some of these men would go through serious operations to alter themselves to where you could not tell if they were a Jew or not a Jew. Okay, sound familiar? Okay, so it mirrors the times of the end. You know, the beasts in Daniel mirrored the beasts in Revelation um, 13. Um, beast with seven heads and the ten horns and the one horn comes up. You know, it's kind of a, it's not an exact representation, but it is a pretty close proximity to that prophecy. Now, so... Within the Hanukkah story, you also learn, and within Maccabees, you also learn, okay, what do you do? What does the believer do when it gets this bad, when it gets to this point? Okay, because, you know, we know how it ends. We're on the winning side. We win. But what do you do? What, what, what steps do you take? When things start doing this gradual slide, what are you supposed to do? Well, there was a man named Matanias, or Matathias, actually, um, who was a priest of God who lived out in a little bitty village called Modin outside Jerusalem. While he had issued these decrees that you're going to sacrifice to the god Jupiter... And you're going to do these things and that, and this and that and the other. He sent watchers out to make sure people were doing it. And then sent soldiers out to force people to do it. Well, in this little village of Modin, there lived Mattathias. And he had uh, five or six sons. And he was a priest. And they came to him and basically said, hey, you're a man of renown in this community. We want you to come out here and sacrifice to Zeus and he basically refused to do it and then one of the people that was out there that uh, was a Greek sympathizer who was a Jew decided he was going to so he went out and stopped him from doing it and ended up fighting the entire or the Greek army that was there so they basically take a stand they draw a line in the sand and say, okay, I'm not willing to do this. It's time to take a stand. Okay, because they believed in the God of their forefathers. Okay, they held on to their faith. Now, they basically took some people and started a small band, went out in the wilderness, and Mattathias dies a few years later, but his son um, Judas... Um, Judas called Maccabee, 
where we get in their family name, Maccabees, um, becomes the leader of this group. So basically, they, this group ends up fighting with the Greek army a couple times. He sends actually up to half of his army at one point to fight this small band, which has grown to probably four or 5,000 people. But in some of the things that they're fighting, they're almost 10 to 1 odds. Okay, And he basically says a couple times that, you know, if God is for us, you know, if we're on the side, of, if we're on God's side, let's go out and fight. And we're going to win either way, basically is what he says. Um, and he actually reminds them. He says, like, do not be afraid of their numbers and do not fear their charge. Remember how our forefathers were saved at the Red Sea when Pharaoh pursued them with the armed force. So they charge out and basically rout an army that's almost ten times their size. Um, he sends an army with elephants, which they don't have elephants around Israel. But as a um, kind of a war cart they use the elephants to run over the soldiers, basically. Um, and they rout that army as well. So they, they fight four or five major battles and end up back in Jerusalem. Um, but when they started, they were basically simple farmers out in Moedin. They were not warriors. So... One of the things that they had to do is they learned how to fight. They taught themselves how to fight. They learned, and as they won battles, they didn't have a lot of military power, swords, shields, that kind of stuff. They had to win a battle or two to arm the men, according to the, the Maccabean account. So they learned how to fight, and they learned how to fight back as they went. So they learned to become the warriors that they needed to be and learned to become the people, just like we need to learn to become the people and study and grow into what God needs us to be to do what he has for us to do. And even though they were small, they didn't care because they had God with them. Okay? So I look around today and I see in this time, you know, Bible-believing Christians are starting to become a minority around our country. You know, they, they didn't let the times and the culture change the way the scripture read they changed themselves to what the scripture said okay so they held fast to the scriptures and they didn't they didn't change and then um, one of the stories which is pretty cool in actually second Maccabees um, Judas Maccabee um, takes the sword of his enemy and starts, and it's evidently some kind of great sword. And um, actually, in part of that book, uh, there's angels fighting for them um, to rout some of these, um, to win some of these battles. But he takes the sword of his enemy and starts using the sword of his enemy to defeat his enemy. It's kind of like, if you look around today, a lot of the you know, one good example I think of using the tools of the enemy to fight back is like we do with uh, Facebook and YouTube and the Internet. Okay, that's a tool of the enemy in some instances. You're one click away from me, anything you can think of. So Christians today have to learn how to fight back using the tools of the enemy. Okay, to reach those that have to be reached in that method. That's just a couple lessons that um, 
kind of learned from that story and some of the ways that I think Hanukkah kind of foreshadows the end times. Okay, now, once they defeat four or five of these battles, and they have a bunch of major or minor skirmishes around and rout a bunch of people out, they finally take the city of Jerusalem back. And they walk into the temple, and the temple is just basically destroyed. It's got pagan idols everywhere. It's got, they've been having, uh, a, for lack of a better word, they've been having orgies within the temple of God. Okay? Do, profaning the temple in any way that they possibly can see fit to, or that they can come up with to profane the temple. The sacrificing of the pigs. All that stuff. So the Maccabees come in and they break down the um, statue of Zeus, which um, another account, not Josephus and um, the Acapa, I cannot remember where I got it from. One account actually says that Antiochus Epiphanes made the face of Zeus or the statue of Zeus to look like himself, raising himself up as a god. Actually, Epiphanes means the revealed one. Or the revelation of God. Or the revealed God. Okay? so And he gave himself that title. His name was Antiochus. And he gave himself, called himself Epiphanes. Um, which a lot of the names and that kind of stuff gets really confusing when you go start going back through there. Because Ptolemy, there's like 12 or 14 Ptolemies. Uh, each one had give themselves a title beyond that. There's six or eight Antiochus or, or Antiochus, uh, 20-something Alexanders back through there when you're trying to lay out timelines and get all this stuff figured out. So there's a lot of different names that are like that. But he gave himself, which evidently was pretty common to give yourself the Epiphanes name because there was a... Ptolemy Epiphanes as well. Um, but basically setting himself up as God in the temple of God, more or less. Okay, this is the way that person related that piece of information. So they come in, they tear down that, then they say, okay, the altar of God that has been in this temple has been desecrated. So they take the stones of the altar out and set them on a hill and end up building a completely new altar and then they come in and rededicate the temple starting on the 25th day of Kislev okay the same day that he um, basically set up the abomination of desolation so they rededicate the temple taking eight days I actually took them two years some were there about to get the temple back in order so that they could rededicate it. There's a lot of um, Jewish rituals, etc., that have to be completed. Uh, everything has to be purified and cleaned and scrubbed, and um, things have to be uh, used water of mixed with the ashes of a red heifer. All those kind of things had to be done, and took them two years to get all of it done before they could actually have the dedication of the temple, which took eight days. And they basically lit a, um, they now light, they use a, a nine-pronged menorah, or a candlestick with nine, nine candles on it now, to commemorate that. The actual temple menorah is only seven. So I think... Pretty much what I've got for tonight. So, any questions on Hanukkah, Antiochus, Epiphanies, all that? I'm trying to make it not boring, but I don't think I succeeded real well. No, no. <laughs> Alexander the Great and Antiochus. It's, some, you know, there, there's some wiggle room in there. Not far. It was um, one, 
right around 168, 170 BC. And he, he did his Well, I do know that from the time um, that the abomination of desolation till they rededicated the temple was somewhere around three and a half years. Okay. I do know that timeline because that, that's spelled out within the book. Um, but don't know exactly how long he ruled. Um, he fought against Egypt for a while, came back to Jerusalem, sacked Jerusalem once, got a bigger army together, went back to Egypt, um, pretty much took over Egypt, um, ended up getting married down there, and then gets kicked out of Egypt. So he gets mad because he got kicked out of Egypt and comes back to Jerusalem and sacks Jerusalem again. Um, so there were, uh, I would say at least 10, 12 years in there of him back and forth like that. He probably ruled somewhere around 20 years. I didn't actually get a hard number on that. That's just a, a guess at the moment. Um, I'm not 100% sure on the, um, the, uh, seven branch menorah for sure. I'm thinking it's something to do with the days of creation, the seven days. Um, I can look that up and find out. Um, I do know that they use a different menorah to celebrate Hanukkah which is a nine-branched. You have a central branch that has a candle lit, and that candle you take and light the other candles, one each day of the eight days of Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. Completion and perfection. Yeah. Any more questions? Any more history lesson? Um, let's see. Basically, the uh, Babylonian Empire, which is then Egypt, Turkey, and Greece. So Assyria, Egypt, Turkey, and Greece. And basically, it's the Seleucid Empire, the Ptolemy Empire, and uh, Dysicus and Cassander um, are the four people that kind of end up ruling those empires right after or within 10 years of Alexander the Great. They're down to four empires from like six generals that split the kingdom up. So, and those four kingdoms represent the four horns that split on the ram. Or actually in... Chapter 7, if you look at the leopard that has four wings and four heads, that is your Grecian Empire there. The leopard is the Grecian Empire. Yes. Yeah. And then if you get into like Daniel 11, it actually takes you through from... <sighs> Starting with the um, Medo-Persian Empire through several, and he, you know, Daniel says, okay, there's going to be three more huge kings of the Persians. And he's um, in the rule of Darius at that point. And, you, and the third one would be the greatest, which would be Xerxes. Yes. Yes, and relates to the story of Esther. And then... That kingdom has a couple more kings, gets cut off by Alexander the Great. And you can go through 11 up until about verse 40. Then it takes a jump. And then at the end of these things, and it changes completely to things that have not yet come to pass. Much like with the chapter 7 of Daniel... You know, we've had the Babylonians, we've had the Greek Empire, we've had the uh, Persian Empire. 
those empires are all completed. We've completed the prophecies of part of the Roman Empire prophecies. But we've not completed all of them. And it's kind of, kind of the same kind of thing in chapter 11 of Daniel. Some of those prophecies, some part of, parts of chapter 11 have come to pass. And parts have not. And so it, it jumps in time, basically. Kind of like his 70-week prophecies. Takes up to 69 weeks and the Messiah comes. But that seventh week, that last week, hasn't happened yet, basically, which is the more or less the tribulation or a picture of the tribulation period. So there, there, there's a, little, a lot that goes into prophecy, interpretation, but a lot of it is personal opinion as well. And the way that you read the text, some, some things, it just lines up so perfectly that it has to be, almost. But, again, it's still opinion. You know, there are some people that don't share my opinion on chapter 8, being Antiochus Epiphanes. There are some people saying that that is the Antichrist. I think that it is a foreshadowing of the Antichrist, which is seen throughout the Bible, you know, multiple times. It's things that happened before, happen again. So, kind of my take on some of that. Um, thought of something else just a minute ago. And actually, it's kind of like the beast in um, Revelations. Did I have... Re okay, I thought I did. So, in Revelation 13... As I stood on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now, do you see any parallels between that beast and the first four beasts? In Daniel 7, the four beasts, the lion, the leopard, and the bear, and then the huge beast with the ten heads, which you don't know what it is, because um, Daniel doesn't explain what that beast actually looks like. But this beast has parts of the three pre previous beasts that we know existed and were completed. So, I mean, you can draw parallels between Revelations and Daniel and the different horns and the different leaders, that kind of stuff. So, it's, it's always interesting. But, so that's Antiochus Epiphanes. What I believe is a foreshadowing of the end times and a foreshadowing of the Antichrist. Or has the spirit of the Antichrist. The Maccabees were the good guys. Yes. Yes, the Maccabees were the good guys. They liberated basically Jerusalem and put valid priests back in the temple. And rededicated the temple. Now, here's another interesting thing. Okay. No Hanukkah. We would never have had Christmas. No Maccabees. We would never have had the temple restored. Okay, They're the ones that restored the temple so that Jesus could be at the temple. Yeah, if you think of it that way. So, God works in wonders and mysterious ways sometimes. And basically, um, within the book of Maccabees, it says that because of their transgressions, because of their sliding away from the Jewish traditions and the Jewish ways and adopting the Hellenistic ways, the worldly ways, the one world government, the one world money, the one world religion kind of thing, that is why he allowed those things to happen. 
that God allowed those things to happen. Yeah, and we're headed right down that same path. Well, a little short today, but God didn't fall asleep, at least. (laughs) Not yet. (laughs) Vic got lost between round one of the goat fight. Yeah, I can I can see that. I I kind of got lost several times, Vic. Just to be honest, um, I would get lost, and that, that's why I brought up the part about the names. So you're you're going through this, you're studying this, and you've got twenty different people, and you're trying to find the information in either Josephus, this book, or a Greek or Roman historian, and you look up Ptolemy. Ptolemy there's twenty something of them. Okay, which one do you want? <laughs> so you have to line up the time periods and between the various sources, that kind of stuff, in order to get the right ones. Um, and actually, there's like seven or eight different Cleopatras that are in there. Seven or eight. Yeah, that's that is their that is their legend with this. I, I can't confirm or deny that. I don't have any basis for that. I don't find any basis for it. But that is their rabbinical tradition, is what we'll call it. <laughs> but you know, and you know, I can't say the Acropa is scripture. But it is useful for, if nothing else, historical references. Um, several of these books happen between what we would call the Old Testament and the New Testament. Several of the things were written in between. I think some of the issues that people have with it, the writing style of like the Book of Maccabees, is more of a Hellenistic writing style. Than Jewish, so I'm pretty sure it was written in Greek first. You you can kind of tell by the way they phrase their words and stuff versus Old Testament style writing. Um, then there's some things with like the first and second book of Ezra that's in the Acropa. Um, I think it was uh, Calvin or one of those had some issues with it and some things that the Catholic Church was doing. Um, I believe actually the idea of um, purgatory comes out of, in my opinion, what is a misinterpretation of some stuff in Second Ezra. Yeah. Now, the Catholic Bible has the books of Maccabees. Maccabees, Ezra, um, yes. The, the Catholic um, uh, Vulgate um, has 80 books versus 66 in the current King James Bible. Now, several of those were in the 1611 King James. This, this entire collection here was in the 1611 King James. Um, in um, mid to mid-1800s, it started fading away. Actually, early 1700s, it probably started fading away. But um, towards the late 1800s, it was completely gone out of the King James Version. I'm not saying if that's right or wrong, but I mean, just you know, know the history. And no. No, no, no. Queen, Queen Esther was um, before that, yeah. Queen Esther is in Old Testament times. You know, this, the, the Maccabees fell after um, the last book of the New Testament was written. That's why it doesn't show up in any of the Old Testament. The Feast of Hanukkah doesn't. Mac, the old the Old Testament about where it stops about 
400 years before Christ is born, somewhere thereabout. Okay? Maccabees didn't happen until 168. Or 160, 160, 170 to 168 before Christ. Okay? So you have 400 years before Christ without a prophet coming out of Jerusalem. Okay? So, this is what I heard. I never studied about it all, but there was like a span of time there, that 400 years, when God basically removed Himself. Not that I mean, not that He did, but I mean, as I'm just saying, that's what I heard. Somebody, somebody said basically He. And that that's. I, you know, I, or if that's how the, I don't know. I just. That sort of lines up with some of the prophecy about that period of time. Basically, 400 years of silence from yeah, God yeah. um, is a, what a lot of people call it. Um, there's some, I can't think of it off the top of my head, but there's some scriptural reference for that. Um, but yeah. So, Maccabees happened within that 400 years. Alexander the Great happened within that 400 years. Okay.